Okay class, uh, we'll get started for today's lecture. Uh, I apologize for the technical glitch in the previous lecture. So I now have a voice recording system as well, running in parallel with the video recording. So if in case the camera is not able to record my audio, there is a factor of safety. So hopefully there won't be any technical glitches in the subsequent lectures. Um, we were talking about matrix theory in the previous class. And in particular, we had talked about rank of a matrix, characteristic polynomial, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, let's talk about symmetric matrices today. So A is in Rn cross N and A is a symmetric matrix. which means that A equals to A transpose. So I have a square matrix and in fact that square matrix is equal to its transpose, so it's a symmetric matrix. And here are the facts that we had talked about in the previous class, but I'm going to write that down again as a recap. So the first is the eigenvalues are real numbers <clears throat> the second one is the eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. So Vi transpose Vj is equal to 0. The third thing that we talked about was we constructed a matrix V with eigenvectors as columns of the matrix V. And let's assume that each of these VI the two norm is equal to one. So I have normalized all the eigenvectors so that their norm is equal to one. Then this matrix V satisfies the following condition, I mean satisfies the following equation. V, V transpose equals to V transpose V equals to identity. So V is a unitary matrix. Okay, so when we have a symmetric matrix, we have learned that the eigenvalues are all real numbers. For a general matrix, it's complex numbers, but for symmetric matrix, it's always going to be real. The eigenvectors are also going to be real eigenvectors. I mean, uh, it's, it, these are vectors in Rn. These are all vectors in Rn, so they are not complex vectors, they are real vectors. And they are all orthogonal to each other, okay? So Vi transpose Vj is equal to 0 when i is not equal to j. Let's assume that we normalized each eigenvector so that the norm is equal to 1. And I constructed a matrix V with eigenvectors as the as columns of this matrix V. It turns out that you know, this matrix is actually a unitary matrix, which means that V, V transpose or V transpose V, they are both identity matrices. And that's because the columns are orthogonal to each other and rows of this matrix are also orthogonal to each other. So that's why it's a unitary matrix. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to talk about 
in the context of symmetric matrices. These are the results that we need to remember. Okay. Any questions so far on this stuff? You may or may not have seen it in your undergraduate linear algebra class, but I just want to recall the result. Uh, if you pick any book on linear algebra in particular, I have some references on Carmen that I've provided. So you can look into those books and uh, you will find the proofs of all these results. I, I mean, it's just a tedious proof where you have to do some algebraic manipulations, but uh, it's not very complicated. Question? No. Okay. In this particular course, in the optimization class, we are always concerned with a very special class of symmetric matrices called positive definite matrices. So let's study what positive definite matrices are. So positive definite if A equals to A transpose and lambda 1 to lambda n is strictly positive. So all the eigenvalues are strictly positive and the matrix itself is symmetric. Both these conditions have to be satisfied for a positive definite matrix. Have any of you seen positive definite matrices before in some class? Okay. I mean, I'm guessing those who, have, who are taking 5555 five, five, five have seen it right in the previous lecture. So, <laughs> so if they nod yes, it, I, I'm not sure whether to. <laughs> Where? LQR control. Yeah, in LQR control, that's right. Oh, you have already seen LQR control. We'll talk about that as well in this class as well as in the 5555. Five, five, five. Okay, <clears throat> so, so this is positive definite if all eigenvalues are positive. It's negative definite if asymmetric and lambda 1 to lambda n is strictly negative. It's positive semi-definite if A equals to A transpose and lambda 1 to lambda n is greater than or equal to 0. And negative semi-definite. if lambda 1 to lambda n is less than or equal to 0. So these are just the definitions of positive definite, negative definite, positive semi-definite, and negative semi-definite matrices. Uh, in this optimization class, we will extensively use positive semi-definite and positive definite matrices, because those are important matrices in the context of optimization algorithms. Any question? No? Okay, so of course positive semi-definite and positive definite matrices inherit all the properties of symmetric matrices because by definition they have to be symmetric matrix. All these matrix have to be symmetric and have to satisfy these conditions in order to be called positive definite or positive semi-definite matrices. There's another property of positive definite or semi-definite matrix, which is uh, if, again fact, if A is positive definite, then X transpose AX is strictly positive for all X in Rn x not equal to 0. So I pick a non-zero vector x and I take x transpose ax, they have to be strictly positive. And if A is positive semi-definite, then
x transpose ax is greater than equal to 0 for all x in Rn. OK. These facts would become very useful in some of the proofs that we'll be doing throughout the course. So please remember these facts. If I pick a non-zero vector, then x transpose ax is strictly positive <coughs> if a is positive definite. On the other hand, if it is positive semi-definite, all I can say is x transpose ax is non-negative. I can't really say that it's strictly positive, even if x is non-zero. So I could pick a positive semi-definite matrix, and I pick a non-zero x, and it's still, uh, I could get 0. So let me give you an example. So my A is 1, 0, 0, 0. It's a positive semi-definite matrix, because it has eigenvalues 1 and 0. Those are the two eigenvalues for this matrix. And let me pick x to be 0, 1. OK? So it's a non-zero vector. And x transpose ax is 0. OK, so I have a positive semi-definite matrix. I pick a non-zero x. There is a possibility that x transpose ax could be equal to 0. That's why it's a positive semi-definite matrix. Any question on this one? No? OK. I'm going to talk about spectral radius now, um, spectral radius of a matrix. And then I'm going to talk about a contraction mapping theorem. Um, so. We'll get into that now. Any question? No questions? I'm going to erase things on the board. OK, spectral radius. OK, so I have a matrix A in Rn cross n. It need not be a symmetric matrix or anything. It's just a matrix. And I have eigenvalues lambda 1 to lambda n in the complex plane. I will always have n eigenvalues for a matrix. So I have a matrix. I have n eigenvalues. I have, uh, I define the spectral radius rho of A as max over i of absolute value of lambda i. OK. So the maximum of the absolute value of eigenvalues is called the spectral radius. And why is spectral radius important? So here is a main, here is a result. So this is from the birth, the appendix of the book by Birdsickers. Uh, and I can, uh, at some point of time, I'll explain to you through assignment or through some homework problem why this theorem holds. So here is the theorem, appendix. So the course text is the nonlinear programming book by Birdsickers. And this theorem is from the appendix of Birdsickers. So for every matrix A in Rn cross N, there exists a norm on Rn 
such that oh for every matrix a and for every epsilon greater than 0 there exists a norm on rn such that norm of ax is less than equal to rho a plus epsilon multiplied by norm of x Okay, uh, just a brief overview, uh, assuming that A is diagonalizable, which means that the eigenvectors are all linearly independent, uh, eigenvectors of A are linearly independent, then A is diagonalizable. When A is diagonalizable, you don't have to pick, you can pick epsilon equal to zero, but the, the norm is actually constructed using the eigen, eigenvectors of A. So eigenvectors of A explicitly plays a role in con construction of this particular norm on the space. Of course, this norm is the same on both the sides. So I take A of x, I take the norm. Uh, it turns out that it's less than or equal to the uh, spectral radius of A times the norm of x. This epsilon uh, needs to be there if A is not diagonalizable. If A is diagonalizable, we don't need to have this epsilon. Then this inequality would hold even without the epsilon by an appropriate choice of norm. That result in itself is not very, I mean, it, it leads to some more, some more result, which is what we are actually very interested in, in this particular class. So this is of course a general, generic result in linear algebra, maybe of independent interest. But for this class, we require a very specific, um, uh, consequence of that particular theorem, which is the following result. Consider the following sequence, xk plus 1 equals to axk plus b. A is of course a matrix and b is a vector. Let me just write it. So x0 is in Rn, A is Rn cross N and B is in Rn. So I constructed a sequence. I started from some arbitrary point in the space and I constructed a sequence by multiplying the element by A, adding B and then doing it all over again. And the result is Uh, if rho of A is less than 1, then xk converges to x bar, which is given by i minus A inverse B. And we'll prove this result in October using what is known as Banach contraction mapping theorem. And uh, we'll prove a more general result in October. And this theorem, this fact would be a consequence of that particular theorem. Okay. So in this theorem, uh, we have to choose the type of norm that will satisfy this? No. Uh, so for given a matrix A and given an epsilon greater than 0, you can construct a norm. So these norms are just like 0, 1, 2, 1, 2. Sorry? These norms are like norm 1, norm 2. 
No, this will be a much more, much more complicated norm than that. Okay, so uh, let me give you an example. Well, uh, so just, just pick this norm. Y equals to U inverse Y one norm where U is constructed as the eigenvectors of matrix A. Okay, now, so this U is basically eigenvectors of matrix A stacked as a, as a matrix and you want all of those eigenvectors to be linearly independent, only then you can take the U inverse, right? So, so if you take this as the norm, I mean, this is one norm, but you could really pick any LP norm here and that's the norm Y, this is the norm Y. So you have to prove now that this is indeed a norm over the space of Rn. And once you prove that this is a norm over the space of Rn, and you try to write this expression, you will see that this indeed holds true. This particular expression holds true for so this norm. No, this is this is true for every x in Rn. Okay. And well, diagonalizable, yeah, in diagonalizable you don't, but this is the general result which includes non-diagonalizable matrices as well. So even for non-diagonalizable matrix, you can find for every epsilon greater than zero, you can find a norm, which is far more complicated than this norm. I mean, construction of that norm requires a little bit more machinery, but you can construct such a norm and, and this statement would still hold. Any other question? Yes. Uh, when you say diagonalizable, uh, for, like for example, it's, uh, this means that it's strictly diagonalizable, no other. Bias. That's right. That's right. So we. So if you have repeated uh, eigen values, for example, you have uh, like a Jordan block. Or exactly. So those in those cases, this result holds with epsilon. So you have to pick an epsilon greater than zero so that this result holds. Yes, yes, for that case. And then the norm construction of that norm is far more complicated. There's a lot of epsilon and inverse and all that crap that goes in for constructing the norm. Uh, if you pick up a book on linear algebra, uh, or maybe you can look at some lecture notes where such a norm is constructed, it's just a, like, two or three pages of just matrix algebra to construct the norm. So that's why I'm not covering it in the class. Any other question? <clears throat> why do you think this result is important? Can someone, why, why, why are we studying convergence of sequences in this class? Numerical Sorry? Numerical right, we are, sol we are using numerical approach to solve optimization and we would like our output of the optimization algorithm to converse to the optimal solution. And so this result or some variations of this result will be invoked again and again throughout the class to show that whatever algorithm we have designed converges to the optimal solution. Okay. Any questions so far on spectral radius? No? Okay, the next topic, which is the final preliminary topic before we jump into optimization, is the definition of convex set and convex function. Okay, so that's the final preliminary stuff that we need to do. So I have a set X which is a subset of Rn and it is a convex set if and only if one of the three conditions have to be satisfied. You can pick any one of the three conditions that I'm going to write, okay? So the first condition is for every x1, x2 in x, alpha in 0, 1, alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 also lies in x. Oh, sorry, not for convex set. For convex set, there is only one, one definition. 
for a convex function, there are three equivalent definitions. Okay, so X is a convex set if and only if this holds for every X1, X2 in X, for every alpha in 0 and 1. The line segment connecting X1 and X2 lies in the set capital X. So this is my set capital X. I'm going to pick any two points. <coughs> X1 and X2. And I'm going to draw a line segment that connects the two point. And every point in this line segment can be written as alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 for an appropriate value of alpha. Okay, so a set is convex if this line segment, the entire line segment that connects X1 and X2 lies within the set capital X. Okay, so an example of a non-convex set would be a horseshoe. This is a horseshoe, I pick an X1, I pick X2, I draw a line segment and the line segment goes outside the set X Therefore, it's not a convex set. This is convex. This is non-convex. This is non-convex because the line segment goes outside the set, capital X. So some examples of a convex set that we will frequently use in this class is X such that AX equal to B, X such that AX is less than equal to B, X such that X is greater than equal to zero, X such that norm of X is less than equal to some radius r and what else are we going to use? Oh, x such that fx is less than or equal to u where f is a convex function. And we will talk about convex function in two minutes. Okay, those are the different types of convex sets we are going to be studying in this, uh, in, the, in the optimization class. Any question? Yes. Right. How do you get the shape? Oh, that's a good question. So how do you get these shapes? Well, in the context of optimization, uh, this is the set of all x that is feasible, okay? So for instance, uh, let's say you are doing a robotic manipulation, the, and, and you have a hand, like it's like a, it has two joints, one ball and socket joint here, and one like just a one dimensional joint here. So there is only so much degree of freedom that you have and that degree of freedom basically decides what this set looks like, okay? So in this case, for instance, let's consider my hand. So this hand can move, oh, actually I can move quite a lot. 
I'm kind of surprised. Okay, so I haven't exercised in a while, so I didn't quite know how much my arm can move, but it seems like it's still working fine. So this, of course, it can it can take a lot of different. Uh, it, it can be in a very different different uh, uh, configurations, but this one can only go from here all the way to here. So it can probably go for 175 degrees or something, right? And now you're looking at two different uh, actions. One is the action here and one is the action here. So you now have a two-dimensional space and you can draw what are the feasible points, feasible ways by which I can, I can move my hands, right? And, uh, and that, in some cases, it will be a convex set. In some cases, it will be a non-convex set, right? Uh, in power systems, for instance, which is uh, according to ratemyprofessor.com, my favorite example. Uh, so in power systems, you want to figure out how much electricity will flow along every transmission line. And you know, it's, it's, all, it's all alternating current, so there are some physics that governs the entire system, which I don't quite understand very well. But according to that physics, the entire set is actually a non-convex set. The entire set of uh, voltage and current and frequency that can flow through the transmission lines is actually a non-convex set. So, so people spend a lot of time uh, in trying to understand how to solve a non-convex problem when you are optimizing over a non-convex set. So we'll talk about all those problems in the, in, during the course. Any other question? Yes, please. What is the symbol on the first line? In the first line here? The fourth, the fourth line. Here? The fourth line. Fourth line. This one. X is less than or equal to R. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, doesn't look like R. This looks like R. Okay. Any other question? Okay, let's talk about convex function. So F from Rn to R is convex if and only if we can pick one of the three equivalent conditions. The first condition is for every x1, x2 in Rn, for every alpha in 0, 1. F evaluated at an intermediate point is less than or equal to the line segment connecting the two function values. Okay, 
So the first definition says that if your function f is, it doesn't require differentiability or anything. Any function, as long as it satisfies this condition, it's a convex function. So let's look at an example. This is x, this is fx, and I have a function f that looks like this. And because it's not differentiable at this point and at this point, uh, the, this is the only definition I can use to guarantee whether that function is convex or not. And what I have to do is I have to look at two points. Let's say this is x1. This is x2. I have to see the line segment connecting the two, two, two function values. This is of f, of f of x1. This is f of x2. And if the line segment is above the function, then it's a convex function for every pair of x1, x2. That's the first definition. Okay, so f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2, so this is the point alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2. This is my function f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2. And this point is alpha f of x1 plus 1 minus alpha f of x2. And as you can see, this value is smaller than this point, which is alpha f of x1 plus 1 minus alpha f of x2. So there are two ways by which you can ascertain whether a function is convex or not. One is, of course, you try to check this for every x1 and x2, which is sort of infeasible. The second is visual in inspection. You look at a function, is, are all line segments connecting the function values above the function itself? Turns out that if it is yes, then it, it's a convex function. Okay? Now, of course, in this class, we are going to talk about smooth functions. So, such complicated functions are not something that we need to worry about. Um, The second way to guarantee that a function is convex or not is for situations where the function can be differentiated once, okay? So if your function can be differentiated once, then for every x and y in Rn, you have to check that Fy should be greater than or equal to Fx plus y minus x transpose gradient of Fx. Let me show you what that looks like. So now I have x, I have y, I have a function that looks like this. Uh, right. This is my fy, this is my fx. And this hyperplane which is tangent to this curve and it's passing through fx. This is my hyperplane fx plus y minus x transpose gradient of fx. That's this hyperplane. And what this statement is requiring is fy be greater than the hyperplane. So this entire curve the entire function has to be above this hyperplane for every such hyperplanes that you can draw. So that's the second definition of a convex function. 
it requires the function to be differentiable once. Any question? No? So a function is convex if every hyperplane that you can draw that is tangent to the function, um, the function is going to be above that hyperplane. Okay, that's what the second definition is saying. The third definition is what we will frequently use in this class, which is the second derivative of the function has to be positive semi-definite for all x. For all x in Rn, the second derivative has to be positive semi-definite. Okay, then it's a convex function. Checking the second derivative is a very, very easy operation, at least for functions that you are that you can uh, easily compute and you can see. Um, for very complicated function, you require a little bit more machinery to prove that this giant matrix would be a positive semi-definite matrix. But in some cases, it still can be done. In fact, uh, if, you have, if you're taking any machine learning class, you will notice that a lot of loss functions in machine learning would satisfy this, this condition. And that's because um, they want, I mean, typically in machine learning, people would want the loss function to be a convex function because it becomes much easier to solve the problem in that case. Could you explain the, the side one more time, how the f of y should be greater than the side so, so this is your f of y, and this point is your fx plus fx plus y minus x transpose gradient of fx. That's this point. And as you can see, f of y is greater than this point in the figure. So this is, uh, this is the uh, equation of a hyperplane that's passing through fx and has a slope gradient of fx. Okay, that's just the way hyperplanes are uh, a transpose a transpose x plus b equals to zero. That's what a hyperplane looks like in n dimension. And this is exactly, so this is your f of x is b, and this x is basically y minus x transpose part, and this a is your gradient of fx, okay? So we are basically shifting the origin. When we do y minus x, we are shifting the origin to x, okay? And, and that's how we get this equation for the hyperplane. Any other question? So if a function is not discontinuous, sorry, if a function is not continuous, then at that point of discontinuity, you disregard number two and three? No, you can't, you so can't. This has to be globally. So in a discontinuous function is never convex? Well, discontinuous function is yes, never convex, but you can't really use two and three because it requires differentiability. So continuity is like a prerequisite. Yeah. Any other question? But, but actually you make an important point. So let me, of course I'm talking about functions that are globally convex. You could have functions that are locally convex, which is convex in a small region. So for instance, uh, let's look at this function. So a function which Let's say my region is between zero to one. Okay, so this is my set, and I only care about this set. I don't care about what happens outside the set. And I have a function that is, that is constant flat until one, and at one it jumps to some large value. This function is convex, even though it's discontinuous, right? And that's because this line segment is above the function, okay? But I'm not, I'm talking about functions that are globally convex, not locally convex.
Okay. Any other question? Yes, please. So, when are we trying to find out like the number of convex or non-convex, which properties like So, so typically, uh, like in 99% of the cases, uh, this is what you typically use. So, uh, you know, like, so, so, so things that I have seen, the convexity is kind of already given because the loss function is made convex. Like, you can pick any loss function you want. So, it's better that you pick a convex loss function rather than a non-convex loss function. So. If you're doing tracking control, you're using a convex loss function. If you're using machine learning, you're using a convex loss function. It just much, e your life becomes much easier if you're using a convex loss function. And, and over, over the long hundred or so years of history, a lot of convex functions have emerged to the surface as being useful for optimization tasks. So we just stick around, stick to those functions. Um, actually along the similar vein, uh, very recently it was, in 2016 there was a paper called Input Convex Neural Network where they talked about neural networks that are convex in the input. Okay, so in that case this condition is automatically satisfied by the construction of the neural network itself. Um, so in many cases, what I'm saying is, you know, it, it, it really takes a lot of uh, experience for you to start designing your own things. But if you look at the literature, most of the people have been using convex loss functions and that's because this property is satisfied by them. Um, any other question? ReLU for instance, uh, ReLU activation is a convex function because it's zero and then it grows linearly. So it's a convex loss function, oh, sorry, convex function. Any other question? Okay, so all the boring stuff is up, over. Now we'll get into optimization, which is why you all have come to this class. So let's talk about optimization, okay? And in order to talk about optimization, so this course is on nonlinear programming. Nonlinear programming means you could be a, it could be a convex function, it could be a non-convex function, so we have to look at optimization more broadly, not just for convex functions. Of course, for convex functions, a lot of beautiful properties would be satisfied. So let's, let's talk about that. So I have a function. This is x, this is f of x, and it's a non-convex function. It, it, it looks something like this. Okay, this is what the function looks like. If you plot it, x on the x-axis and fx on the y-axis. Okay, and we want to minimize this function. Okay, we want to come up with an algorithm that gets to the minimum of this function. Now, there are two things you will find. One is this point, and the other is this point. So, let me call this x2, let me call this x1. So I have two points, x1 and x2. And what do you think your algorithm should output? What's the minimum of this function? At what point is this function minimized? x1, right? So x1, this is what looks like a minimum. What about x2? Does it look like a minimum? Sorry? Local minimum. Okay, so x1 appears to be the minimum if you look at the entire space. But x2 appears to be a minimum if you're just looking at the vicinity of x2. So if you're looking only at this interval, then x2 appears to be a minimum. But if you're looking at this interval, then x1 is the minimum, right? So that leads us to define uh, or, or make the notion of minimum precise which is a global minimum and a local minimum. So x is global minimum, if f of x, sorry, x star, 
f of x star is less than f of x for all x in Rn. And then we have local minimum x star is local minimum if and only if these are all definitions. If and only if there exists an open set or open neighborhood of x star open neighborhood u such that f of x star is less than or equal to f of x for all x in u. Okay, so by looking at the, by inspecting this figure, we can readily say that x1 is actually a global minimum and a local minimum, but x2 is just a local minimum. It's not a global minimum. And why is that? Well, of course, the function at x1, this is my f of x1, the entire function is above this particular line f of x1. So naturally f of x star is less than or equal to f of x for all x in Rn. However, if I look at x2, uh, I can come up with an open neighborhood. This is my open neighborhood. Actually, let me just make it here. This is my open neighborhood u and within this, neighborhood u, the function value is above the function value at x2. And therefore, uh, x2 is a local minimum, not a global minimum. Right. So the reason why you need an open neighborhood is because a closed neighborhood can contain a point. Just one point is a closed neighborhood of x star. Just x star itself is a closed neighborhood of x star. So it doesn't allow you to look outside of x star. If I write any neighborhood without writing open, you can just comp let x star be that closed neighborhood. And just you are just looking at this point and then every point is a local minimum and therefore the definition is not useful. For the definition to be useful, you want to be able to sit at x star, but you want to look around what the value of the function looks like. And that's why you need it to be an open neighborhood so that, so that you have some notion of length, right? Any other question? Okay, so now that we have understood global and local minimum, uh, what we are going to study in the next class is necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality which allows you to come up with certificates that, hey, look, I've, I've seen this point and here is a certificate that I can give that this point is optimal or not optimal. Okay, so that's what we are going to talk about in the next class, necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality. Thank you.